I'm going to talk to you about process management and what it actually means to be a process. Because there's a lot of confusion between is the process the actual code that's executing? Is it what it looks like inside of the kernel? And so we're going to explain all that. So first of all, let's take a look at the topics that we're going to cover today. We're going to say, what is a process? We're going to talk about the file sections that are inside of sort of like what's called ELF, executable and linkable format. It's a particular file format, but uh, most file formats follow something like that, where you have CPU instructions in one side, global data in another side, and things like that. We'll talk about virtualization of memory and the CPU. We'll talk about task structures, states, context, termination, and parentless tasks. So all these are things to consider whenever you are managing processes inside of a kernel. Remember, from the first lecture, kernels are the go-between between hardware and software. They also have to make sure that the CPU is running some sort of instruction. And so the kernel is responsible for taking one process, putting it on the CPU. And then as that CPU runs, it can come in and preempt it and say, okay, now it's the next person. Now, the next subject that we're gonna talk about is process scheduling. That's actually how we pick which process we're going to choose. But for process management, this is all about what is a process, how do we use a process, and things like that. So. A process is just simply a group of instructions that run, and that's it, during execution. That's all it is. And it contains resources associated with the program. So for example, in Linux, a process is self-contained and it has its own file resources, memory, uh, pending signals, process state, that sort of stuff, whether it's sleeping, whether it's running, that sort of stuff. And then what's called the context. And essentially, the context is what it's going to look like on the CPU. Essentially, all that means is the registers and floating point registers and things like that. So threads, so we talked about a process is essentially the execution of code on a CPU. Now threads, on the other hand, are tasks to actually perform the work on the CPU. So whereas the process can think is like a superset, a global parent, and then part of a process is actually its thread. It's the actual work it needs to perform. So remember the context is part of it, but those aren't CPU instructions. And so those are the registers, those are the data, the state of the process at that time. But the thread itself is the working half of it. So in Linux, a process is a thread. I guess that sort of goes against what I just said, but what really means is a process stores a thread. And multi-thread process actually have multiple, are, are part of a group. So if you fork off multiple processes like you did in 360, they're all part of the same group unless you set GID, set the group ID. And what that allows you to do is you can treat all those as a singular process but they have different threads, meaning they have different codes of execution that they're doing, but they belong to the same process group. They share file resources, they share memory, sometimes that sort of stuff. So to create a process, there's many different ways we, you could do this. So Windows, there's one way to create a process, and it's just say, create a process, and it creates it. In Linux, it's a little bit different. In most Unix, it's different. In Unix, we fork, every process has a parent, and there's a single process that runs all the time. So let me pull this up. If we do a PS, we always see that process ID number one, in this case it was called systemd, but it's what's called the init process. And the init process, everybody belongs to the init process. So whenever we want our first shell or something like that, the init process is the only process that is actually executed by the kernel itself. Other than that, init can fork off a duplicate of itself, and then after that we can overwrite whatever the memory image is of the, the duplicated process and create whatever process we want. So for example, my Z shell here. So that is forked off of the shell. So when I did PSXHUA, it actually forked off another Z shell and then executed PS on that duplication. So you, hopefully you've done most of that inside of, in CS360, so it's not too new to you. So virtualization, we talked about this during operating systems portion. Virtualization is one of those three services that are provided to us. Remember, it's abstraction, virtualization, and services. And so virtualization, we're trying to provide a virtual CPU and virtualized memory. So we're actually zooming in into what virtualization actually is. We're trying to see that the process always looks, so whenever I run a process on a CPU, it should look like it's the only process that's ever running. And so it does its thing. I ask it to open a file. It opens the file. And to the process, it seems like it was... There's no time at all in between there. However, because we have multi-user systems, sometimes we only have a single processor. Well, the kernel is responsible for virtualizing that CPU so that it looks like we have multiple processes that are running on multiple processors. And so what we're trying to do is make each process look like it's running on some processor. And that way there, what 
happens is most of these processes can run simultaneously. Now, granted, in the uni processor, we can't execute simultaneously. Instead, what we have to do is we have to pull one process off, put another process on. But it's so fast that it looks like it's simultaneous, but it's obviously not simultaneously. With multiple cores and multiple CPUs, actually, we can have two things running simultaneously at the same time quantum. The other one is virtualized memory. So we talked about virtualized CPU where it looks like we're running multiple processes on multiple CPUs. Virtual memory is something entirely different where we use the memory management unit and we use virtual addresses. And so in physical RAM, so let's take a look at physical RAM. So if we looked at something like physical RAM, we would see something that looks sort of like this. I can't draw very well on this, but whatever. So this is our physical RAM. And I can have 10 processes look like it's going to be the exact same section of RAM. So in here, I can say this is process A. This is going to be process B. Now, in physical RAM, process A and B are obviously separate memory locations. However, in virtual RAM, I can say A goes from 0 to 1,000, and B goes from 0 to 1,000. So what virtual memory means is this 0 is actually mapped to whatever this physical location is. This 0 is mapped to whatever physical location that is. So virtual memory says to both processes, yeah, your memory address is 0 or your memory address is 1000, whatever it happens to be. And what's going to happen behind the scenes, unannounced to the process or the program itself, is it's actually translating that address into the actual physical RAM. So whereas A and B look like they're using the exact same memory locations, they're not. And so the kernel is actually what gets to decide, it programs the MMU and gets to decide where in physical RAM A and B are going to be located. So a task structure is actually what it looks like in RAM inside the kernel. And it's just a structure, just like a normal class or structure that you've done in C++. And it stores all the information about a task. And so what I had pulled up previously here, if we open up process.h here, we can see that struct process is listed right here. Now in Linux, they call them task stru structures, but in the 361 operating system, we're going to use struct process just to make it a little bit easier to see what this is. Now we've got, we store our pieces of information such as the process ID, the mode, that means whether it's running in privilege mode, user mode, or machine mode. It stores a little bit of uh, statistics about it, the switches, the runtime, the number of switches. PC stands for the program counter, that is the current address of the executing instruction. So whenever we pull a process off the, pro off the processor, we have to know the last instruction that it executed. So PC is actually the instruction that it's currently executing. So whenever we preempt a process, we store, okay, we gotta make sure that we actually execute this instruction because it never happened before. And so that's why we store PC, that's the memory address in RAM where we can find that instruction. QM is your quantum multiplier. That's how long it gets to stay on the CP before it's preempted. Priority, we'll talk about that when we get to scheduling, but it's not that big of a deal now. We store the page map, that's for virtual memory. Remember, a page map is actually stored in RAM. And so whenever we're, the kernel programs the memory management unit, it has to have a location in RAM where that first page table is located. And then from there, the page table actually stores where the other page tables are located. So you only need to store the root, the head. We store where the stack is, so each process has to have its own stack so that they don't clobber each other. And then we store the process name and its state, whether it's running, sleeping, waiting, or it's dead. And then finally, we have what's called the context. If we scroll up here, we can see that the context is just simply the registers as well as the floating point registers. So regs right here are the general purpose registers in risk five, that's A0, A1, T0, T1, S0, all those, as well as RA, the return address, and things like that and the stack pointer. And so the FP regs are for your doubles and floats and stuff like that. So they use different registers because they're stored differently on the processor. Your process states, we have dead, running, sleeping, and waiting. Now, Linux uses a slightly different. They have running, they have task interruptible and task uninterruptible. Interruptible means it's sleeping, it means it can be interrupted and woken prematurely, whereas waiting uninterruptible typically means it's waiting on I.O. So if you send it a signal, it's not going to wake up the process. The only time, only way to wake up the process is for the event that it's waiting for to occur. And so as you can see, this test structure right here stores all the information. Now the information that we don't have on this test structure that Linux would store, now Linux's test structure is enormous, it's huge, but you also have to store your file descriptors because they belong to each one. So like 0, 1, 2. That's standard in, standard out, standard error, things like that. Those have to be stored inside the task structure so that whenever we put it back on the CPU, we know which file zero is. We know which file one is, that sort of stuff. If everybody shared the same table, well, then I would be able to open and read your files, and you'd be able to open and read my files.
So that is what a context is. The context is just simply what it looks like on the CPU. So the CPU has a defined set of registers, a de defined set of memory, that sort of stuff. In the context, we're just taking a snapshot of that process on a working CPU and we're saying, okay, cool, we take you, we store you, that way there we can store you in memory so that you're not running anymore. You're in suspended animation. That way there when it comes back to your, your time to work on the CPU, we can grab all that information, store it back onto the CPU, and it looks like nothing ever changed. And that is that virtualization. It doesn't look like to the process that it was ever suspended because we restore all the registers to exactly what it used to look like. It'd be like you going to sleep, us tearing down your bedroom, but us building up the bedroom, painting the walls exactly as it was before you went to sleep. That way there when you wake up, it doesn't look like we did anything. And that's what occurs behind the, the CPU. Finally, when we have to terminate a process, that is kind of a, a neat thing because remember, every process has a child or every child or every process has a parent, which means that if I kill the parent and now I have an orphan child, it has to be reparented. And we're going to talk about that in the next slide when we get to parenting, uh, parentless tasks. But essentially what we have to do is there's a system call called exit. So remember, a list of instructions, that's all a process is just a list of instructions and we execute those lists of instructions if we actually never call system call exit what's going to happen is it's going to keep running and go to the next instruction next instruction next instruction next instruction which we didn't even define those instructions so it's whatever was in ram it's like whenever you have an uninitialized variable it's just garbage and so more likely than not you're going to fetch an invalid memory address which will give you a segmentation fault and you can actually do this by writing raw assembly and not calling exit. If you do that, it's probably going to crash. So exit is the system call. Remember, system call goes from an application to the kernel, and it actually tells the kernel, hey, look, I need to terminate this process. And so what it's going to do is it's going to take it off the CPU, free all the memory associated with it, and then close all the files, that sort of stuff. And then after that, now it's a dead process. Now there are other things that have to occur because it depends on whether it's a child, depends on whether it's a group, and it has to send signals to the parent says, hey, look, the child just died. So a parentless task is something that could occur. So remember in it, process ID number one is the only process, and I showed you a snippet of code down here, where in it is actually the only process that is called by the kernel. After that, in it spawns everything else off, all your shells, all of your system programs, things like that are spawned by in it. So as you can see on the slide that I have presented, there are four different locations that it looks for. It looks for in it in three different locations. If you can't find any of those, it just runs a shell and says, I don't know what to do. And then your shell spawns all the processes. But that's how the Unix style of process management works. Windows is a little bit different where you can just say add process. Our kernel that we have for 361 is more of the Windows style. We just say add a process, it adds it to a, a list of tasks. Now in Linux, we have a dynamic list of tasks. That means we allocate on the heap, we create a new process and it's circular, doubly circular list. That means we have a previous pointer and a next pointer. And if we drop off the bottom, we go back to the head. Or if we go previous from the head, we go to the bottom of the list. That's what it means to be doubly circular. Finally, a parentless task has to be reparented. Remember, every single task must have a parent. The only one, only exception to that is in it, process ID number one. In it cannot close, otherwise you can't spawn any more processes. So if in it dies for any reason, it calls sys exit or anything like that, you're done. You have to restart the machine, restart the kernel so that it can call a new in it process. And typically what we do is if a parent dies, so let's take a look at a, a process tree. Let's get rid of this. So if we had in it up here, so let's say this is in it. We have process A, which has two children, B and C. Now, if B dies, it will notify process A that, hey, look, your child died. Because typically what you do is if you took 360, you wait for the child to complete. So if I spawn off B and C, then A is going to wait for B and C to finish. And there's a system call called wait that allows it to do that. So this is not a problem. But what would happen? So C is running right now. B is already dead. And then we kill A. Okay. Well, C becomes what's called an orphan. Obviously, it's a child that has no parent. And so what happens is we have to reparent that. And the normal thing to do is whatever happens to be above it. So in this case, in it spawned A. And so what we do is we just close this little line here. C is now a child of in it. And that's what it means to be reparented. And the reason is because somebody has to be notified if a child dies, because there's resources associated with that that need to be cleaned up. And so that's why we have to reparent those. Now, remember, that's for the Unix-style systems. So other systems do something differently. 
So what we talked about, a process, remember that's what it looks like. It's a snapshot of executing code on a CPU and it's stored in a task structure or in ours, a process structure. Now, the file sections that we were talking about are where the CPU instructions are located, where we store all this information. So remember, in ELF sections, we actually have four different locations. So ELF stands for executable and linkable format. And that's the format for all executable, all linkable object files inside of mo most Unix systems. If you use G++, you have a .o file, or if you have a.out, those are ELF binaries. And so in there, we have four data or four sections. We have what's called the text section, and that's where CPU instructions are stored. We have the data section. So all we mean by section is if you looked at the entire file, they're broken up into these pieces. So we have the text section. That's just a, a grouping of CPU instructions. Data are where we store initialized global variables. Okay, then we have what's called the RO data. That's initialized constants. The RO stands for read only. And then finally, we have what's called the BSS section, and that's uninitialized. I don't know if I spell that right, whatever, globals. Okay, so one thing that's missing here are your locals. Local variables are stored on the stack. And so we have just a chunk of memory called the stack, starts at the bottom, work its, works its way to the top. And so this is how we can actually, so the kernel can treat CPU instructions differently. Remember through the memory management unit, we can make it read only, we can make it write only, we can make it execute, so we can protect the different types of memory. So if we don't want somebody, some malicious hacker to be able to edit our CPU instructions while they're running, we can say that text is execute read only. So if I try to write to it, it's going to go to the kernel and say, hey, somebody tried to write to the text section. And so that's why we break these up into different sections, BSS section, because whenever we run a process, the BSS section is uninitialized globals. Well, BSS is supposed to be zero and the kernel is responsible for setting the BSS section to zero. RO data and data sections are actually stored in the executable, but they contain data. And so it's up to the kernel whenever it loads this to load those in the appropriate section for the process. So the process stores t text section. Remember PC, program counter, that's where we actually have to tell the process to start running. So if we were to read an ELF binary, Okay, so if we did this, we have an ELF header, that's just magic, 7F454C, that actually says ELF. So 45 is E, 4C is L, 46 is F. And that just identifies this as a ELF header. So in here, we actually have an entry point address. So my code starts at this memory address. But if you look down here, here's the text section, it tells you the offset of there. So it's 2000 4C50. That's where the first instruction can be found. We have our RO data, that's the read only data, the data. And then there's other ones in here, but those are typically for debugging for G edification. And so we talked about the file sections, virtualization, how we virtualize memory. Remember, we do that through the memory management unit. We virtualize the CPU by time slicing. We preempt a process, we pull it off the CPU, schedule a new process. And we'll talk about how we schedule the new processes in a, in a different lecture. But in this case, that's what we mean by virtualizing the CPU. Sh the process should not know anything about what CPU it's in. Now, there's obviously ways you can figure that out. And sometimes that's important. But for most processes, that's not important. Just run me and I'll be good. We talked about the task structure. My task structure is much smaller, but we talked about some of the information that goes inside the task structure. We talked about the states. That's your running state, your uninterruptible sleep state, and your interruptible sleep state. So essentially how it translates to ours is we have running. It means it's allowed to run on the CPU. It doesn't mean it's actually running on the CPU because remember, it could be stored in that suspended animation state, but it's still eligible to run. We have the sleeping, which means it's waiting for a timer, or it's waiting, which means it's waiting for IO to complete. Talked about the context, those are essentially what it looks like on the CPU. Remember the CPU has a certain number of registers and that stores the state of a process. Talked about termination, we actually have to call the exit system call and that's how the kernel knows to pull it off the scheduler. And then for parentless tasks, we actually have to reparent any child that is orphaned. And that can lead to a little bit of difficulty whenever you're writing your kernel, writing your operating system. And that covers process management.